Um, excellent. You guys are right on track, and all of this is correct. But let's make sure that we're being very specific about talking um, fictional literary texts, just as you're doing with the Joy Luck Club. And remember that this skill, I, I, it doesn't matter if you're using the Joy Luck Club or a separate piece, Gesundheit, or To Kill Mockingbird or anything that you want. This will apply to every fictional literary text. So let me give you some reasons why you use quotation for the support. The first, if you're analyzing quote, uh, connotation. Uh, somebody give me a definition. Zoe, definition of connotation. Oh my gosh, look at that, making me happy. It's like she writes dictionaries. Nice. The indirect meaning associated with a word. So if I'm analyzing a single word, I want that word on the page. If I'm talking about how in a separate piece um, there is a, uh, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the direct quote, but a black steeple, I believe it was, of the, um, the tree. That's part of the imagery that Knowles uses. And I want that word on the page so I can analyze how exactly that particular word makes me feel. I need a quotation. Got to use it. Here's an example. And I'm giving you two parts, the three-part quote analysis. So let's see what we can do with part three. Um, in her description of Makeham, Lee describes bony mules hitched to Hoover carts, flicked flies in the sh sweltering shade of the live oaks on the square. It's almost poetic. It's a nice quotation. I'm going to use that to analyze connotation. Can you tell me what this says? Can you tell me what the connotation is? Can you pick out a word and say, hey, she used that word for this purpose? Chris? Sweltering. sweltering. How does sweltering make you feel, Chris? Yeah, well, uh, yeah probably right now in this temperature it makes you feel kind of happy. But um, sweltering makes you feel hot, tired, uncomfortable. How does she add to that, Sydney? Um, so That's right. Horses are objects of power. Mules are objects of servitude, and uh, they're kind of a, a little bit pathetic. And then when you describe them as bony and emaciated, that makes us feel further disgusted and uncomfortable. Mitch? Uh, live oaks. But does that, OK, the live oaks, does that build on this? Or does it contrast this? It contrasts. So interesting, in our step three, we might actually talk about how there's a little bit of sign of liveliness, hope, and something positive in there. Give me one other that's negative. Hitched. Kurt, sure. Hitched um, seems like I am chained to something slavishly. Uh, if you know what Hoover carts are, Hoover carts are those ramshackle carts called Hoover carts because of the Depression, President Hoover, and so on and so forth. Navina. Yeah, flies. If I want to talk about how Lee is building a setting, I need her words on the page. I need to use a quotation. I can't just say in my own words in a paraphrase, well, she makes it feel uncomfortable. I've got to prove it. So when Chris is saying, yeah, you know what, you need that wor those words, and I throw up on there, paraphrasing is insufficient. This is one of those cases. I want to add authority. You guys talked about this too. I want the author's words and my words to be saying the same thing. I want them to merge together. I want you to realize that I am so powerful in my literary analysis that the author and I are on the exact same page. Lee continues to develop the possibility of empathy that Atticus had advised, scout, advised to scout early in the novel. Sometimes empathy is simple. Scout experiences it and learns that just standing on the Radley porch was enough. What have I done in terms of writing to try to add that authority? How did I write this in such a way that I want to say that the author and I are on the same page? Brian. Perfect. Her words and my words merge into a sentence almost like we wrote that sentence together. So she and I are kind of thinking the same thing. And I've already seen some of you experimenting with Joy Luck Club material, people who have given it to me for um, proofing, where that melding, that merger happens. 
And if it's this fluid kind of merger, you and the author are on the same page. You're more authoritative in your literary analysis. But it works really well when it's slight. This works best when you're using portions of their sentences, not the entire thing. All right. Um, express a thematic statement. Quite often, John Knowles, Harper Lee, other authors give a theme through a character. Somebody says something directly, and you say, oh, there's the point of the story. So it's often useful. It's kind of like this, the adding authority, but um, it doesn't merge quite as smoothly. So when advising Jem on the proper use of his new rifle, Atticus says, remember, it's a sin to kill a mockingbird. I want that quotation in there because that's a central quotation. It's powerful. It goes directly to the title of the novel. So I need that authenticity. And of course, uh, you can use this with John Knowles' separate piece and Leper's statement that everything has to evolve or else it perishes. Now we're getting a little bit more advanced. Some of those others you could see pretty easily. As sophomores in an honors track, and especially if you move to um, AP next year, teachers like me will continue to encourage you not to talk about what's going on in a novel, but how it's going on in the novel. How exactly the author is developing something. How the author is writing. Use of language. Uh, use of technique. And we've been doing that with the Joy Luck Club when we say, well, OK, there's a flashback. Don't tell me there is a flashback. Tell me why she uses flashback. And then a more advanced um, interpretation would be showing flashback trend throughout, when she uses it, when she does it. And that's why your literary analysis claims always focus on the author as grammatical subject. You're looking at the style. Using quotations can help you very clearly discuss the author's writing style, the author's use of language. So when dis oh, um, we're now in Lord of the Flies, by the way. I've shifted off uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, a novel you haven't read, nor will you read this year. When discussing Jack's feelings while hunting, Golding uses his lengthy sentence structure to express the rambling nature of the boy's thoughts. While Jack feels the hunt, Golding writes, his mind was crowded with memories, memories of the knowledge that had come to them when they closed in on the struggling pig, knowledge that they had outwitted a living thing, imposed their will upon it, taken away its life like a long, satisfying drink. Now, that's a long quotation. And I want that entire quotation in there because of my claim. I'm saying, guess what? The author uses a particular type of sentence structure to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. The long sentence structure says, this kid is not thinking coherently. His thoughts are running one into another. He's not rational. He's emotional. <coughs> He's experiencing something, but not really thinking about it. And you can do that with, uh, um, with quite a lot. Let's not discuss the author's style. Let's discuss the character of the speaker. You want to know, and th Morgan was talking about this, you want to know how that character is, what that character is like, let's hear that character talk. You learn a lot about something by listening to the way they talk. Not just what they say, but how they say it. So once again, we're in Lord of the Flies. Jack feels his authority shaking, and that insecurity breaks down his speech. He fails to be able to complete his ideas. In the face of Ralph's challenge after the hunt, he says, I painted my face. I stole up. Now you, you eat, all of you, and I. And we can see that in the third part of my quotation analysis, I'm going to talk about how the breakdown, the choppiness, the incomplete thoughts, the sentence fragments indicate fragmentation in his brain and the breakdown of his authority. This is sophisticated. And you guys are totally ready for this, this kind of analysis of literature. And it's driven by quotation analysis. Warnings. Watch out for this. Chris has said that sometimes paraphrasing doesn't work sufficiently. Sometimes it does. If you can express the same idea just as clearly in your own words, then do it. If you're summarizing plot events, for instance, then just paraphrase. If you're saying, um, let's see, OK, uh, Su Yen lost her babies on the road um, on the road while she was fleeing 
okay, I just summarized a plot event. Do I need a quotation there? No. Not just to summarize it. I don't need that unless I'm doing one of the tasks that we talked about before. Maybe I'm talking about how Tan expresses that moment. Maybe I'm talking about how Su Yan expresses that moment. Maybe I'm talking about the language used to create a connotation of tragedy. If that's the case, then I want a quotation. If I do something tricky to add the authority, that would be fine also. But just to basically present the event, I just need the paraphrase. So don't just do this all the time. And if this is a powerful technique, you don't want to overuse it. You want to make it count. Cut your quotations. I've seen some of you doing this too, and it's making me happy. Because nothing is, well, plenty of things are more annoying. But uh, one, of the, uh, one of the frustrations of reading student writing is a student who decides that they want three lines of quotation when really they need half a sentence of it. Sometimes using a single word works. If that word is powerful, then use it. And uh, feel free to cut those sentences. Use the ellipses. That's the three dot. Remember when you're typing dots, spaces in between, not just dot, dot, dot. It's dot, space, dot, space, dot, space. Um, actually, technically, it's space, dot, space, dot, space, dot, space. Right, that works. I only want the important details. Now, looking back at my example here, I want that long quotation because my point is the rambling nature of this long, unbroken sentence. So I need all that. Here, I only need, need that little bit. Here, I need a portion of a sentence. Here, I'm going to make, uh, you guys actually made really good use of all of those words. Therefore, everything's used really clearly. So excellent. I, that's fine. Here, I only need that portion to make my point. So don't use the long ones. Cut. OK, um, enough of the direct lecture portion of the class. Questions? No? It's a skill. It'll come with doing. Tim? Um, if you use one, one word, like the, yes. the quote, he has said the best page number and everything. Uh, um, yes, I would like you to. Um, I would like you to use the, the page references on that. As a student writer, generally you're accountable for that. If I were to see a professional literary analyst do that, they probably wouldn't cite it. But um, the rules are different for professionals than they are for students. So for you, yes. Anything else? All right, then 